here's how you should think about like, what's a mistake that you have the permission to make. One of the things that was really helpful we shared with the team was someone shared this picture of a boat. So with a water line and like, look, the below the water line stuff is going to sink the boat. The stuff that's above the water that's not going to stink the ship. Like let's make them, learn from them, not make them again. What we really need you to do is like to watch the water line. In this episode, I talked to Robert Glazer, who built a newsletter called Friday Forward to a couple hundred thousand subscribers, which is really impressive. But then he also did it while running a full-time business, while running a team of, uh, I think, over 200 people now. They're growing really quickly. The company's called Acceleration Partners, and they uh, are an agency that works with basically all the biggest affiliate programs out there. So it's fascinating the way that he took the content, the way that he republished on LinkedIn and, and wrote for Forbes and Inc. and others. Um, we get into other things like company culture. He also runs a, a virtual team. Uh, we get into why he writes books and produces courses, even as he's you know running a multi-million dollar company. A lot of interesting things. There are questions that I'm asking, kind of really for myself, because he has this interesting split of content creator and CEO uh, that I try to find that balance and walk that line as well. So it's a fun conversation. Uh, we've been friends for a long time and uh, haven't caught up in quite a while. So. Uh, it's just fun to chat and I hope you enjoy the episode. Bob, welcome to the show. Thanks, Nathan. Good to be here. So we actually haven't talked in, in a long time. I was just thinking back to PC pre pre COVID probably that we really talked. <laughs> yeah, <about>. exactly. <laughs> um, but we've had so many good conversations, like a few interesting things that we have in common is both running good sized firms, like as CEOs, and then also loving content creation and loving yeah. the side of it. Um, so I want to talk about all kinds of stuff related to that. Uh, but first, your newsletter, Friday Forward. Like, will you just tell the high level where that came from? Because it, as I understand it, you didn't set out to start a newsletter. You you set out to uh, create content for your team. Uh, yeah, and, and and even I set out to like work on my morning routine. So so I actually had come from a, a leadership uh, event, pretty intensive event that Entrepreneurs Organization EO had had put on. I think it's. I've been telling the story a long time, and then you realize you got to change your dates, like probably seven years ago now. Um, and uh, the, uh, the real focus was on a morning routine, uh, not the real focus, a big focus was on a morning routine, starting off the days positively, kind of some, you know, time for thoughtful reflection, reading something positive, writing, um, which is a great routine for a creator anyway. And I, I, you know, we were given some stuff to read, it was a little too like rainbow and unicorny, like, you can do it quotes like it wasn't my cup of tea. And so I when I got back and I continued through the routine, I was like, you know what, maybe maybe I'll combine these activities. I have some stories that I like and some quotes and some things in this folder. Like, so I thought like our team was like 40 at the time, I think maybe 45 and we're all distributed. Um, we've always been virtual. And so I, I was like, I'll just start writing this note to the team on Fridays. And it won't be about our business or anything. It'll be about a story or something kind of inspirational, motivational, getting better. Started sending these things. I changed the name a few times um, for, for a couple of months. I didn't think anyone was reading them. Um, but then I, I did get some like notes back saying, you know what, I did this thing you talked about three or four weeks ago, or thanks, that was really helpful. And the other curious thing was I got notes like, hey, I shared this with my wife's company, um, or you know, my brother shared this with his family. He loves it. I've been sending it to him. So I was actually at another EO conference um, a couple of months later, talking with some other CEOs about like, this is this has been really good. It's been good for me. It makes me think about something, write it. It's been a great way to connect to the team. You know, you you should all try this. And they said, Oh yeah, well, send us yours. So I sent it to four or five of them. And like good entrepreneurs, like one started his own and did it this year. And the other said, This is great. We'll just send this stuff to our teams. Um, <laughs> this is super helpful. So at that point, I was like, huh, I wonder if this people would be interested outside. Um, I did not know about uh convert kit at the time. So I I, I found sort of a a, a newsletter service that would just look as much like a plain email as possible because yep. I was doing this all via BCC. I threw like a couple hundred friends on it uh, and family and other people. And I expected like, what the hell is this? Unsubscribe. And I just kept getting nice notes and people were sharing it. Someone posted something on Inc. This is the only newsletter I read. And 2,000 people signed up that day. And now it's like a couple hundred thousand people in 60 countries. And it's totally crazy. That's, yeah, that's wild. Um, I'm realizing that a lot of these newsletters that are really high quality and, and people love start with something random like that. Like I think of um, my friend Kay who runs Rad Reads. Like 
yeah. when you started that, it was just like, I don't, here's some links for some friends, you know, and it, it starts in that really simple way. I love the idea of the CEO being like, yeah, I should do Wait, how about instead of me writing it, you just write yeah. it? And I well, the, the, there's a phrase in EO or it called R&D, which is rip off and duplicate, uh, which <laughs> is uh, so... Yeah, they were like, "This is good. This is my team will love this. Just send it to me on Fridays." Uh, and it made so it made it way in the Slack channel and all that stuff. So yeah, yeah. What are some of the things like as we fast forward? What are some of the opportunities and things like, or favorite moments that have come from having the newsletter? And then we can back it up. It's I, it is nothing about my business, and I actually got pressure from our team to be like, "Hey, shouldn't this be like under our brand or otherwise?" And I think. There's people, look, I, I, my agency, you know, we run affiliate marketing agency. A lot of time people ask for advice. They're like, what kind of blog or thing should I write to make money? I'm like, it kind of doesn't work like that. Like these people, like this guy loves grills. This woman loves whatever it is. Like they, they, they get a following and because they love the content and they want to write about it every day. Then they think about monetization. Right. I, I think, you know, with something like Friday Forward or probably other ones that work, like I just try to create value for the reader every week. If I had had an ulterior motive, then I think the content wouldn't have been good and, and, and it wouldn't have spread. So it's led to all kinds of discussions, speaking all around the world, you know, my, my two books um, for sure. And just, uh, you know, a lot of times, like, again, Friday forward, like you would never know in a million years what I did or what my business did, but I will get an introduction to our business from a Friday forward because it's, I'm just in that person's inbox every Friday. Like that's the mental trigger, not, not, the marketing content that we put out like all over the place. So that's kind of been an interesting learning for me um, because again, it, while it's totally separate, there's clearly been a, a, a nice halo effect. Yeah. Are there, does that happen a lot of business coming from Friday forward or is it more just the kind of the rising tide? It happens a fair amount. And I will say a lot of times I'm reaching out to a, a client or prospect or partner in our industry, and they will say something about love that Friday Ford or otherwise. I, I was actually at an industry conference, PT, pre COVID, and I, cause I was telling someone that we put out a ton of content in our industry, like the best content in our industry. We have an industry book or otherwise. And I'm walking around the big event party, like the night with all the people in our industry, and people are coming up and saying, hey, they're like, I loved that Friday Ford four weeks ago. I loved that one too much. Like, no one's talking about the five reasons to start an affiliate for like, I just thought it was like an interesting thing where, you know, no one for all the content we have that was industry wise, that wasn't what anyone was talking to me about. Yeah. I was, I was thinking about, um, James Clear, yeah. someone who I've been friends with for a long time and, and got to watch him build his newsletter. And he got to this point where it was probably around maybe uh, 50, hundred thousand subscribers where he realized that the level of person that was following and reading his stuff was like, he would reach out of, hey, could I, could we do this? He's got this long shot, like, can I get this introduction to? Yeah, and they thought he was like this, this amazing figure. Yeah, exactly. And they were like, oh, I'm already subscribed, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, and so I imagine you had the same kind of thing. I actually, I, I do hundred day check-ins with our clients and there's a really big global client we saw like in the news all the day. And she's like, oh, I've been a reader of your Friday Forward for years. Um, and, and so the sales team didn't know that. No one knew that, but, but. You know, I, I have to think that that factored into the decision making process, even though, again, it has nothing to do with right. what it is that we do. She's like, I used to listen to it on the tube to work uh, or read it on the tube to work every Friday. Mm. So do you do anything specific um, like to try to understand who's subscribed to it? Like I know James at one point with his newsletter, like specifically, I don't know how he did it, but he went and looked through to find like what which NFL teams were like had coaches that were <laughs> subscribed or any of those. I, 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 I'll give you some product, uh, you know, uh, a feature of things yeah. that would help with this uh, if you want them. But yeah, a lot of times I'd sort by, um, I, I'd sort by, uh, one of the tools that really helped me was sorting by most open by person. Okay, yeah. And then when I opened that in the thing, it would show me, I could clearly see it was being spread around a company because that person's copy of it was being opened in 200 cities, you know, around <laughs> right. the world. Um, so, so that would actually tip me off that it was like a company. Right. And then I might go look at that company's URL in the in the sort of subscriber list and see if there are a bunch of people from that company. But that's also be an awesome feature to try to join together like a company statistic right. and show people or some sort of heat map about like who's opening it. But I, I, 
I, I, that is the one thing I do. I look every week at the total number of opens by a subscriber because it gives me a sense of if it's being forwarded beyond the initial open. And then like, if someone has a 2000 next to it, like they've sent this to a lot of people. And so it's just sort of a yeah. mental note in my head. Yeah, that's interesting. I like that. Um, okay, so let's talk about how the newsletter grew. Because obviously going from you know a couple hundred people to a couple hundred thousand people is yeah. um, a lot of work. We don't want to be hand wavy about it. <laughs> there's, there's a lot in that. Maybe like from that 300 people to say the first five or 10,000. Yeah. What did that part of the journey look like? Yeah, so um, look, once it started to get momentum, there were a couple articles. There was a Boston Globe article. There was an Inc. article. Kind of, again, this is the newsletter I read. Saw some big bumps on that. Um, anyone who emailed me, you know, would be added to the list. <laughs> you know, so I, I was good about anyone that I interacted with would, would make the cut. I actually had a tool that would scrape my inbox and do that, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, you know, because and, 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 and thinking through LinkedIn. So I was good about making sure that people I were connected to were on it. And then I started to just think more about touch points, you know, in terms of if someone was doing A, we'd sign them up for B. Um, I think that's, you know, that's something I focused on as the list has gotten uh, bigger. But I, I really, I also, because it was being forwarded a lot, I tried um, and, and I, you know, stole some, I ripped off and duplicated. Like just, I tried to be clever with the lines around like, um, hey, you're stealing this copy from someone else and it's free. Like sign up to get <laughs> sign up to get your own. So I tried to make sure that the people that were reading it or got forwarded one knew it was like a newsletter that they could get every week right. and try to get them to sign up. And um, the other thing I was really good about is I, I would syndicate them on LinkedIn or I'd post on LinkedIn and I'd always say at the bottom, hey, this is part of my Friday Forward series. You can sign up here. And that actually generated a fair amount. Look, LinkedIn is one of the few media syndication things that lets you, you know, they're not paying you to do it. It's not Inc. It's your channel. So, you know, they, it, it, I think the thing that people forget is they, they're, you can, you know, you can really actively drive signups to, to uh, a newsletter list from LinkedIn. Yeah. And I remember when we were talking um, in a long Uber ride from in Park City, I think back to the airport yeah. or something like that. That's something I was surprised by is that LinkedIn was driving a, a good number of subscribers for you. Was there a particular strategy there? Or are you just resyndicating the content? And Look, luck is as good as strategy. So I, I, I got timing. I was one of the first ones to have the newsletter series and the subscribe button. Yeah. Plus, at the time, I was part of a small group where, where LinkedIn was boosting the content. So I would publish an article. People would see the subscribe button. It would go out to hundreds of thousands of people. And I'd make sure to let them know that, again, I think with a newsletter, when someone forwards a newsletter, the person receiving it could assume like, this is a right. one-time thing, but if they really love the writing, like someone did one of those articles yesterday, brilliant thing the person wrote. You know, at the end of the day, it said, I, "Some not this isn't the language, but like I write things like this all the time, <laughs> you know, get them directly here. I, prob I probably would have done that, but I don't, I don't think people think to, think to do right. that as much. So, you know, if you, if you publish on Inc or you publish on Forbes or any of these things, they really don't let you drive to your newsletter list, but Things like Medium and Quora and and LinkedIn, you know, you can you you can very easily drive to your own list. Do you think that like that opportunity? Obviously, you timed timed it well through, you know, just luck and that and timing. Yeah, I don't know if it would work the same today, but that's true for any of the channels as they're taking off, right? <laughs> right. But the the republishing idea is interesting because a lot of people say like, no, I want that content on my own site, and I'm using James as an example again. That's something that he did in his first business, he did a lot of, like he would write guest posts for everything. And yeah. then in for jamesclear.com, he took the approach of saying, I'm going to only like the original content goes on my site, but I'll re-syndicate it, you know, Quora, Medium, LinkedIn, anywhere else. Yeah, I, I, li I like the syndication thing. And again, I mean, I've done, I have columns on Inc and Forbes and you just, you can't link to yourself, right? So um, I, if I put something on there, I have to right. take it all out. Um, and if you put on LinkedIn, Quora, Medium, you can Link to your own books, your own material, your own newsletters. Um, so, so I think there's some positive value of that from an SEO standpoint in terms of also putting it on your own site and getting people to link into that that article. But you know, I I consider LinkedIn a great way to build like your own audience on LinkedIn. I mean, I think I actually think the distribution of Friday Forward is probably bigger on LinkedIn than it is via email, just based on my subscriber count there. 
Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, I also realized I finally accepted your LinkedIn request from three years you ago. Yeah, I've been sitting there every day. Yeah, I've you've been waiting for years. it. <laughs> so I was like, what did I, how did I offend them? Like, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so the, the Forbes and Inc., like those columns, are you getting a good amount of, like a good amount of additional attention from them? Like, how do you think about that in your content strategy? Yeah, I, I think uh, to me, those, uh, I try to focus on things there that uh, where the authority is helpful, right? I, I think where you're writing a definitive piece. So I, like, for example, my, you know, and you, you can syndicate anything on there after two weeks too. But, but when I'm coming out with a remote book, like the three things to, you know, ask your employer right. about remote work, I, I, I think if you're sharing that with people or otherwise, there is an authority aspect of, 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 of an anchor of Forbes. One thing I've noticed, though, and I, I don't know how this is impacting the staff, the, the sites are really pushing towards login and, and paywall. And yeah. like, there's just a lot of stuff going on. And I have a feeling like it's probably reducing readership because even me, even I now when I go reading my own article, you know, it's like you, you got to get a subscription. Like, as a, so I assume that's more limiting these days. We ran into that when uh, earlier this year we acquired a company called Fanbridge, which is uh, email marketing for musicians. And Billboard covered the like, did you know broke the story, but it was yeah. behind a paywall. And we were like, come on, you know. And so we you know emailed them, and like an hour or two later, they're like, okay, we'll take it out from behind the paywall. But you run into that where you want the name brand, or you're like, oh look, Ink, you know, or you know for yeah. like like a piece of content. But but you're right, it gets really hard when it's behind a paywall. Look, and I, I feel bad. Like everyone needs a business model. Yeah. I don't know, you know, what it is, but I, I there's a, there's a another like large global newspaper I write for and they asked me to work on a series or something and I sent it to them and they sent me the article. I wrote back uh, and the guy was really receptive to the feedback and I was like, honestly, I was like, I went and read this article and I feel like I'm being attacked by your banner ads. There is a full size one. There is a blinking one. There is a video playing. There's right. like, this is terrible user experience. Like I can't even find the content. And like, I know you have to make money, but like you guys are a prestigious, like big, like this is horrible. Um, I, 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 and it's just not, I was like, and, and look, we know a lot of this from the affiliate space at CU. I'm like, look at what CNN and Buzzfeed and these folks are doing. I mean, they're, they're, they're trying to tie, you know, write really good content, then, then, you know, link to the things or link to the relevant things or put it in the text. So that if you're talking about this thing, buying it and make some money that way. But cause a lot of these are just Google display ads, but it was really like, I actually felt like I was under attack, like on, the, on the page. I was like, this is not the future. And he was, he was very receptive. He's like, I know it's bad. I'm like, I'm just not sure that putting a hundred display ads on a page is actually going to make you more money than putting the one or two right things that are contextual to what's being discussed. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So when you're writing, so like what's the relationship between say Friday Forward and um, like the, what you write for Forbes or Inc? Is it resyndicated? Is it a version of the story that you then write differently? Yeah, I have taken Friday Forwards and adapted them to like Inc. or Forbes. Uh, not that often. Like those need a kind of like one, two, three format. And they really yeah. don't want you to talk about yourself. And actually Friday Forward, it usually has personal anecdotes. But like on occasion, like if there's a concept that's really good, I will rework that into that structure. But but you know, the thing that I've come to understand from, from James and from other people, and I, I used to be from Ben Hardy, like I used to be a little more, but like the title really matters. Like I, I it, 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 you know, it, it feels like you're being a little mark, but if you write a so-so title, the way the algorithm works, no one's going to read the thing. So I, I think as a writer, you have to flip your brain on this and say like, not that you should have a bait and switch title or sensation, but Inc. used to send me the top 10 titles every month. And it's really clear. The number one thing that, the top two that, because either you see it and you read it now and it gets positive algorithm velocity, or if you think that I don't need to read that now and it doesn't get momentum quickly, it drops to the bottom of the pile. So I, you know, I have an editor and, and editing the title, I, I'll push them and, and I'm like, warm cup of tea. That's one of my edits. Someone said that to me once about my writing. Like, I was like, this feels like a warm cup of tea that you don't need to read. Like, and and, and and I think as a writer, um, I actually think everyone needs to embrace that a little bit. Your your titles they shouldn't be bait and switchy. They shouldn't be National Enquirer, but they 
they kind of need to make people want to read it now. So yeah, I'm definitely guilty of that. Of all, I'll write a three thousand word article that I'm really proud of. This is one of those things that I'm always going to refer back to, and then I'm like, oh, and the title. There we go. Yep, that'll work for the title, and you just kind of move on, and, and then you realize like. Wait, why didn't people read it? Right, and, and well, we, we operate in this world where it goes up, it goes into feeds, and like the stuff that's quickly looked at and clicked on and acted upon rises to the top. And, and, and so you're talking about four to five times probably the number of people that would read your article with the right title. And by, and by the way, Inc, uh, Inc. forces A-B titling. And I would tell you that I am, I, I am wrong more than half, like so wrong at which, is the, which would be the more effective title, which shows why it's, the testing is, is interesting, but every, every time I get the top list, again, it sounds like they are all, you know, you won't believe why Delta Airlines is firing all of its pilots, or this is the number one thing that all successful things have in common. Like those are the ones that are constantly the most read articles. Yeah. Okay. So I want to ask about writing process because showing up, like when you're running a company and, and you've got a substantial team now and, and all that. Yeah. And showing up every week and like writing good original content that people want to forward and share with their, you know, with their teams and everything else, that's hard to do. So tell me about your process for producing that quality content on a consistent basis. Yeah. So Friday forward, I have a very good editor on my team, worked with him for two years. He could probably write an article and I couldn't have told you, you know, if my voice, I mean, he knows kind of yeah. my voice at this point, but uh, I once had someone write me on Friday for and say, whatever you pay people to write these for you, like it's worth it. And I was like, thanks, dude. Like I write them. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I, I will draft it. Like I can draft a thousand words pretty fast. It'll just be a mess. Like it takes me four times as long to edit versus a good editor is like, can he can edit in half an hour? What would take, take him four hours to write it. And it would take me, you know, four hours to edit it. So um, I try to just get out that kind of, concept draft quickly on Friday forward. Um, I usually get one get one big edit back and then we'll do one or two revs on tweaking. It's kind of like, it just meant like I write it on Sunday or Monday, Tuesday's edit day, Wednesday we set it up. It needs to go out by uh, 1 p.m. on Thursday because that's 7 a.m. in uh, uh, New Zealand on Friday, I think, yeah. uh, which is the first, the first 7 a.m. Um, so uh, that's the process on Friday forward. On, on other things, I, I've actually, with the editor, sort of embraced the scribe process. So, so like I did that this morning, which is I said, look, here's an article I think we should write. Here's the title, kind of intro concept, main three points, and I'll I'll bullet it all out, and I'll say we need we need a data point on this or that, and I may even like audio record mm -hmm. uh, a minute on it, and then they'll draft it up for me and it actually works really well um, at, at, in terms of because um, sometimes it's like, I think this is the point we want to make, but let's see if we can find a stat that, you know, backs this up. So I, they're always my ideas. It's always my, you know, you know, framework, but I, I've always leaned heavily on editors because I can spit out a lot quickly and then to say, can you please take this mess and help me Make it good. <laughs> clean it up a little bit? Yeah. Uh how do you go about finding an editor for that? It's like you obviously have an editor that you've had a long, long-term relationship. Yeah. I've worked with different people. I, it, it takes about six months, I think to really get one of the things I would suggest is if you start working with an editor is really use track changes. And if this is like the same thing, a delegation, like when I would change something, I would explain why I was changing it. Right. Like yeah. I never you say always and never in my writing. I don't want to say anything that can be disproven. Right. So I, I would always like go the extra, like I make comments about why I would like never use like if you can use such as, right? Uh, so yep. trying to develop those rules so that as they're editing, they really like understand my tone and my language and that it sounds authentic. Does that end up going into a, you know, a standard operating procedure for how to write like Bob? <laughs> Uh, I think so. I haven't seen it, but I actually think they have it. But that's, I, I should check that that we have that. But yeah, it probably has sort of like a whatever those guides are, those standardized guides, right? Of like, right, what is the Bobism? And it, I mean, it's not proper English or grammar. It's just, it's funny. I always feel like you know something. This is being a delegation. You know something by gut. But when someone forces you to explain it what it is, it's actually really helpful from a training standpoint. Like, I don't like the sentence. Well, why? Because it, it it says something that can be disproven, right? So then then you realize, oh, that's really the 
that's really the core thing that the editor could could learn from. Okay, so I have to ask about saying something that can be disproven. Like, there's other writers that would be really trying to have like concrete statements, you know, and and all that. So why yeah. why are you on the other side of of trying to specifically avoid that? Well, there's opinion and fact, right? So your opinion can be argued, but I don't like to say like I, I think, for example, let's say I said like you know, all email marketing CRM companies like make this mistake, right? Or make the same mistake. Well, then, you know, Nathan comes along and publishes an article and says, we absolutely don't right. do that, right? I, I, I could write an opinion that says, you know, I think the vast majority, right. like, or something like, but, but, but actually, I think it, it actually hurts your credibility if you state something as an absolute that someone can disprove. That you can have a theory, you can have an opinion, you can have whatever that can be disproven. Like, for example, I have a, a an opinion that you should never make counter offers, like in, in a business. Now, um, but if I said that counter offers never work, that would right. be uh, someone would be like, "No, it worked," and I'd be like, "No, but actually, you're proving my point. They work one out of ten times." Uh, and so my point is that why would you do anything that works one out of ten times? What you're all going to do is you're going to tell me about those one out of ten, and you're never going to talk about the nine out of ten. So we just do it as a rule because we know it has a ten percent acceptance rate. So that's the difference between stating that as like a fact that, that is a proof point versus an opinion. That makes sense. I'm tracking with that because people always latch on to like, oh, let me find the one exception to prove you wrong. Correct. They'll attack back and then they'll be right because they'll post, they'll find the thing. Like here's an example once like I even said, and I knew it was going to happen and it was actually kind of funny. But in one of my Friday forwards, I was talking about progress and like innovation. I was like, look, if you're the best run horse and buggy shop in America, you know, say you probably don't have a great business. And so, of course, someone sends me this horse and buggy shop in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and Amish country. Like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. I know there's like two of them, but like that wasn't the that wasn't the point of the article. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. The other thing that I want to ask about is the PR side. Um, like how because you talked about it in the early days. Um, getting some like the the news that are mentioned in in different press publications and stuff yeah like that. what what is your pr strategy how does that fit into the growth of it or is it all just kind of organic and and whatever comes yeah we, we've tried pr uh over the time what's interesting is that we have found that a lot of the pr in our industry has not been very valuable like it's just people know it's our industry if they want to talk about our industry they'll find us they'll include us in something like it's not it's still not a widely discussed thing, but but actually these other stories tend to get picked up more. Like Acceleration Partners does a pays five hundred dollars to for people to go on vacation and not check their email, right? Or you know, founder wrote this email and now two hundred thousand people read it. So so it's actually some of these other things that have gotten us kind of more. I'm still not convinced. You can't. It's really hard to measure any of this stuff. So I'd rather get it organically, you know, do an hour thing, no, I waste my time than to pay someone five or $10,000 a month to, to not actually be able to measure what, what we're getting from that. I, I've, I've continually been disappointed with our corporate PR efforts, unless they are super targeted on an award, an industry thing or something like that. You just, you know, if someone writes about how our industry is changing and we are changing our industry at the Wall Street Journal cover story, like that's going to help our business. But every article where Robert Glazer weighs in with one line, like I, we operate in partner performance outcome marketing. So I'm always thinking about how is someone going to go from that article to researching my business to buy that they're never going to like it. So it might make us feel good that my name was in there. But there's if I had to bet any amount of money that this would lead to business, the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That that makes sense. And and that's kind of the way that I've thought about it as well. And I, I've seen these like ancillary things be picked up so much more. Yeah. And those, those are free, right? You almost just get those from doing this stuff and people hearing about the policy at your company or, or, you know, people writing about this really cool thing that, you know, ConvertKit's doing. And then someone says, oh, I mean, I need a new email company. So I like what they're doing and I respect that. Right. Versus like, again, if you tried to pitch the Wall Street Journal on email marketing stories, I think you'd be, right. you know, wildly <laughs> underwhelmed with the results that you'd probably get. Yeah. I also think people have had a really hard time in the last 24 months getting any PR, outside, any mass market TV PR outside of 
things related to the election, social justice, and COVID, right? right? It is anyone I know who's launched a book has had like no success with mass market PR in the last 24 months. They just can't <laughs> get them to talk about the stuff. Yeah. So speaking of books and courses, um, you've got a few of each and I'm curious, like when you set out to write a book or produce a course, what's the, what's the thing that you're optimizing for in that? Like, is it probably, probably a good question to ask for before I uh, started on that. Process. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, it, I'm optimizing really for my sort of why and, and, and purpose, which is to like share ideas that help people and organizations grow. That's, that's sort of my core purpose. That's why when I figure out something, I kind of want to like crowdsource it. Um, so I, I'm thinking about what makes you know, the, the, the impact, I think, as you know, like, and, and, you know, I've read a bunch of your stuff, like a, a, a book is sort of the, the top of the tent, but really like other, if your name's not like Tim Ferriss or Malcolm Gladwell or Daniel Steele, like you're just not going to make a living off of, off of, uh, writing books. And so if you do want there to be something that is more revenue generating, generating under that, then you've got to have sort of a logical thing that, that comes next. And, you know, and talking to a lot of people and back to that sort of teaching thing, realizing that also the thing about books is particularly global books, which might like I get the data six months later. Like I'm, I work in affiliate where we get everything real time around the world. And then the book data you get six months later. Um, so it's been really interesting about courses is that, um, look, if a book changed someone's life, they might still not pay $30 more from it. If I told you there was an app that was $9, you'd be like, oh my God, a $9 app. But you go buy a $14 IPA, you know, this afternoon, no problem. So something about book has a, a limiting price structure. And, and, and if you work with a publisher, you're going to make like a buck or two a copy. Um, so, but, but, but a $100 course sounds reasonable or a $500 course sounds reasonable. The margins are great and you get all of the data um, you know, in real time. So, and I think the most important thing, and look, I learned this from the pandemic a little bit um, and, 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 and DTC. So think about the restaurants during the pandemic. So there were restaurants that had loyalty programs, knew their customers, mm -hmm. all this stuff, could reach out to them, could let them know that they were doing delivery, they were doing wholesale drop share kits. There are other restaurants that were packed every day of the week who had no idea. They know you, Nathan, hey, Nathan, but I don't right. know how the hell to get in touch with Nathan, right? So, so I think it's critical these days, whether it's a course, a download or something like, if someone loves your book and your content, like you want a direct connection to that person as best as you can. Yeah, and I mean, we saw that all across the board in the pandemic of like, it kind of flipped which businesses right. were doing well. And there were a lot that were doing. The businesses that knew their customers were like 10x better off than the businesses who yeah, did. Yeah, for sure. So when we think about putting out a course, the question that I have on, on the revenue side is, right, you, you run a substantial business already. And so yeah. how do you think about uh, the revenue from courses? Is that is that meaningful? Is that just like you're trying to get the ideas out there and it's nice to uh, get paid for it so that it pays back the production costs? Or is that like actually a, a revenue stream that you track and are interested in growing? I think it's a little bit B plus C, like in terms of Look, one of the things people don't realize, I think people get used to Friday Ford being free, uh, you know, other stuff. Like, I, you know, I offered when people <laughs> bought the book, this is, I think this is the creator conundrum of, of, of sometimes. Like, you know, I offered either you bought the 99 cent ebook during launch week or you bought the full price audiobook or whatever book and I gave you the $80 course for free. So, of course, I had three people, you know, say, if I buy the 99 cent ebook, will you give me the $80 course for free? I'm like, I've been delivering value to you for like three years. Like, is, 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 it, is it too much to ask for like $5? Right. Like, it's just sort of, you know, it's insulting at the end of the day. Um, so I, I think it's, um, I think it's important to establish, um, uh, Pete Vargas has sort of influenced me on this a little bit in terms of the, you know, what is the sort of one to many versus done with you versus one to one? I think there's an assumption that you are just out there doing this, you know, and available for anything. I mean, I have people asking me, can you come talk about this to my forum? Can you come do this? And then it's like, you don't kind of ask a lawyer for free legal advice. So, so I, I do think it is important to sort of establish like, Hey, that the book might be X, but you know, 
speaking has a price, this has a price, the content has sort of price. And, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not looking to retire on it, but I, I would like to cover the costs of a lot of, you know, it's a, there's a lot of cost to edit content, produce content, produce a podcast. Um, but over time, um, that would be a good income stream to have. Like, to me, it's a win-win. Is there something I can deliver to people of real value that they can get me, like the core value course where they come out of that and they say that was life changing and, and, you know, that can also be profitable. Like that would be great. Um, because I think sometimes we have our profit in one place and our passion in the other. And I always say the only, the only people I'm really jealous of in the world are golfers because the guy made $3 million and won the masters on Sunday. He just wants to go do the same right. thing on Monday. Right. <laughs> so if you can, if you can add value, connect with people and they're happy to exchange like a fee for that, like then that's, that's sustainable. But I do think people sort of also, again, to that example, don't underestimate like what it costs and just, you know, you have a couple hundred thousand person email list and a podcast and you, this service. And then that's 10 bucks a month. Like, the free newsletter could be a fair amount of money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as the way I, that I know, since the free newsletter is what drives my business, <laughs> you know, yeah. I know it can be quite a bit of money. Except you own a newsletter company. So, you <laughs> yeah. know. <laughs> yep, exactly. Um, and I, look, I thought, I, I actually was reading some strategies last week on, also people want to dialogue, they want to write, you know me, it's like it's a lot of people. Like I, I'm starting to envision what more of a, premium right. community looks like. And again, to sort of bifurcate and say, I don't think I want to charge for the newsletter, but if you want to talk about this, if you want advice or otherwise, like I can't, I, I you know, for what I charge an hour for in the, like, I can't, like I, that just, I can't just be on the hook for everyone in the world to do that with them. So I, I've, I've been open. Look, I'd be curious to your thoughts. And I've been thinking about what is, what does that look like? I'm not sure I want to charge for the newsletter. Um, but, but how do I have sort of a, a premium group of people who right. would like access or more dialogue and that, but, but that has to have some cost to it. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people doing this, um, with their newsletters. And so I think it's a good, a good model. Actually, uh, there's a startup called circle, um, that I invested in and others did of like basically making this, it's effectively like community forums type software, but like a modern, yeah. modern version of it. Um, and that works really well. Like, Here's the newsletter. And then if you want to pay a hundred dollars a year, $25 right. a month, That's exactly like what any, thinking, right? anything, any version of that. A couple of things. You don't want to make a new treadmill for yourself, right? You have a yeah. treadmill that's working very well. Like treadmill has a negative connotation. Friday forward is a yeah. treadmill for you. It's just a, a very effective yeah. treadmill. And so be careful to make another thing that you have to show up for. And you have that obligation. Totally, totally, totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you don't want to end up hating that. And so yeah. I would really make it about the connection to other people. And when you show up, that's a bonus. Um, yeah. Because then people are like, who else reads Friday Forward? Who else is the biggest fan of Friday Forward? We tested, yeah, and we tested that. That's what we played around with with a free Facebook group. So I think we were going down that yeah. route. So that is good, good advice. And then, then you can show up and it's fun yeah. because it's not an obligation. And then, you know, you show up every week or every month right. or whatever. But, that, but that's icing, not not cave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that, that's the biggest thing. Um, and then I would charge enough, especially cause you're in the business market. Like whenever I see people putting these things out and it's like $5 a month, you know, or yeah. 10, even $10 a month, it's just like, that's not, that's not enough. Like I would probably put it. I, I would say buy, you need buy-in. Like I, I very rarely give away things for free, even if I would want to, because I think that person's not going to follow through. They're not going right. to show up. I won't, I won't, I, re, I won't do speaking for free events for the most part, because I think those, you know, those people will tell you that there's 2000 people coming and they'll get 200 because there's right. no, <laughs> there's no skin in the game. Yeah. So I would do something like $500 a year as the, the price point, yeah. because the, then people are saying like, okay, I'm committing for a year. Uh, it's like a substantial amount of money. You know, it's not quite an impulse buy. It sets the barrier, like the, the bottom end of who's going to, uh, um, to sign up, right? Someone who isn't going to pay five hundred dollars yeah. a year to like troll your community, you know. And yeah. so it, it also sends a signal to everyone, like, oh, okay, people who do this are going to be going to be invested. Uh, and also, churn yeah. on on like membership style content is super high compared to software and subscription, you know, in that sense. And so, it, going an annual plan is going to cut down on significant churn, and you have time to deliver value. Whereas if you 
like the paid newsletter that's monthly or something like that. Right. They get, if people don't get value for two months, they're on vacation. And then they'll, right. They'll then they're like, off. I'm out. I mean, to you said, if you go to paid, there's an interesting, I mean, I went through all these, I read all the articles and you probably have some good ones. If you go to paid, you're probably going to cut your audience 90%. Right. Um, so you could argue those are the people that, 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 that really matter. Um, but um, again, I think it's more of like, what could you give the 10% that is above and beyond that rather than cutting out yep. the 90%. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the way to go of adding something for, for the premium side. I actually yesterday launched a hobby paid newsletter. I made it just a hundred bucks one time, like a one-time payment. And really I wanted to write about like what creators should do after they've made the bar I set was $200,000 a year. Like I've done yeah. so much writing about how to get to that point. And then everyone yeah. who gets there, which is amazing, then they're like, what do I do now? Hey, you should do like an NFT blockchain thing on this. So you sell 100, <laughs> $100 subscriptions and that's all you're going to sell, right? So then maybe they have like, they actually you have to you have to buy into it, right? If you want to get into like, they can actually increase in value. That's right. It's not just that. I've seen dumber ideas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh man, I've seen so many <laughs> dumb ideas in, in crypto and blockchain. It's amazing. But, but it, it, it magically works. Okay. Uh, one thing that I want to talk about is more the intersection between your content and, and the company. Um, and, and specifically as you spend your time, how do you think about, like, do you think about them as separate things? And I'm, I'm asking, I, I never did before, you know, we're in a little different now we bought on, brought on an investment partner last year. And so like, um, I, I have to think about that a little differently versus like, Hey, it's all my world and I do what I do what I want to. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I do think about that. Like for, for example, um, look, I just came out with this book. It's a bestseller. It's not about our business on how to thrive in the virtual workplace. Um, you know, we're in a talent war right now. We've been doing virtual work for, as I'm sure you are and every other business in digital, we've been doing digital work for 10 years. And, and now that remote work for 10 years, I, I think everyone's remote. Like a big part of our positioning is we know how to do this. We've been doing this, you know, forever. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, I just drafted an article this morning, um, you know, the four questions to ask, you know, a potential employer about remote work. And, and so the premise is like, it's not all the same, right? So that, so that's a helpful piece for the book. It's a mm -hmm. helpful piece for our company and a value proposition. I always said to people, um, we, and we do this a lot internally for our company writing, if you're asked something four or five times, write an article about right. it, right? Even better, publish that on Forbes so that when a candidate comes to us and says, how are you different you know, from a remote? Then you say, oh, well, here's the Inc. article about the four questions you should ask uh, all companies. And, I, and I've given this tip to a lot of companies, uh, my financial advisor. I'm like, look, you get asked it four times, you write an article, you have it published somewhere and people are like, oh, like this person knows what they're talking about. Like it doesn't sound like you're making it up on the on the spot, and and, and that all those things are are, are thought. So, I, I I do I like I keep different lists where I'm like this is kind of a Friday forward article. This is a industry head on. You know why partner marketing is going to be the next wave of of digital marketing, and then there's the stuff that's in between around like it has some company value, it has some value outside, and I think that's sort of like. You know, in the in PR, we're not paying for it. So that's sort of like the PR that we don't know what the value is, but we're also not paying for it. So we'll try to measure it as best we can. Yeah, I love that approach of having like for getting clients, or in this case, the thing that we're all trying to do is is get customer or not customers, get team members, right? Yeah. Like recruiting is the biggest thing that we're doing, and you're right. Like we used to have this huge advantage of being, you know, I don't know what the stats were, but certainly not even one in 10 companies being remote or remote friendly. And now it's like, Oh, it's a hundred percent. So right. So you're not that, but, but you and I both know that they're all just selling people. Oh, you can come work remote, yeah. but like, it's very different for a whole company that's built around that versus this whole team's in LA. You're in rural Pennsylvania. You're going to be zooming. I, you know, when they, when they pitch on this, I think every, this is like the difference in college and like difference between rushing a fraternity or sorority and then pledging, like, you know, it's right. just, like, Mark, like they, they, they're selling you on a vision. I'm not sure that vision is going to turn out to be true in a lot of companies, but it's going to take a while for people to figure that out. So yeah, we want, it's good for us to people to read yeah. that, ask those questions, know how we would answer them. I, I think you should always be publishing that sort of content around your, that, that strengthens your employee value proposition, um, all that stuff. 
Yeah. And I love that of specifically putting it, like placing the content somewhere else. Like we have that content on our site, but it's right. so much better to, to link out to it and be like, well, right. I mean, you didn't even have to say like, here's the article that I wrote for Inc. You know, you can say like, here's right. what well, Inc's you called me and I said, here's some really good content for your weekly Inc column. Like, do you want to write an article about this? And I'd be like, yeah, that's a perfect thing. Right. I mean, this is, this is how the world works. And then you point to the coverage and I mean, this is, this is, this is how the world works. <laughs> yes, all the, all the string is behind the scenes. Yeah, so I'll expect a request from you next, next yeah, week. I'll, I'll have to think about what that is specifically, but but yeah, <laughs> we'll make it happen. Let's see, what else did I want to ask you about? Oh, let's talk about company culture. That's something I'm trying to think if you yeah. and I had met before we did a panel. I think we met like literally on that panel, like live. That's so. how we met, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a topic that we're both uh, super passionate about. You, at one point, I don't know if this is still true, like things are in flux. You were the number one rated CEO on Glassdoor for a long time. I think I was, num I was number two for one year. Number two. You didn't. You yeah. never got to number one? That's disappointing. No, no never got to number one. <laughs> and it's very hard to stay up there. Um, my experience, and I think I was giving this experience to a, share to a, a, someone who's in one of my forums last night, whose company is about 100 people winning all these culture awards. And I said, just be ready. Like you're about to hit, I can tell you like, when you win all these things and whatever, you, you you hit this point where then the people who are upset in any way, like, you know, make it their mission to 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 be heard. Right. Um, what? Oh, yeah. oh, just that now you're at you like you have this. Um, you, you're you now that you have all these things, you are going to be a target, and it's going to frustrate right. you, and you're going to now start getting the negative reviews on Glassdoor and stuff because you put yourself on a really high pedestal and somehow someone's going to be unhappy or whatever. And they're going to yeah. want to make sure that the world knows that you are not perfect, um, which no one really is. But I, I, I was yeah. giving him the speech last night because he's, the company's great. And they have an amazing culture and they're winning all these awards. And I'm like, it, it's coming. Like, I, right. <laughs> um, I, you know, we, I look, you and I have a similar approach. Like, I don't, I don't think that we are this best place to work in the world for everyone. I think that a great culture is when what you do, what you say, uh, what you think, say, and do are in alignment, mm -hmm. and and every company has a unique value proposition. I say it's like universities, right? The University of I don't say Michigan, like fifty thousand person campus, rah rah, very different than a small liberal arts school in Maine of five hundred person in a class. They could both be great schools, but they are appealing to totally different demographics. They're clear about their value propositions, and and they go with that. And I think the best thing a company can do is you know, say what it does, but I don't think any company is great for, for anyone. You know, our, our job is to figure out the, we found it's about less than 2% of the people that are really good match for, you know, our culture and how we work in our industry and our, our environment. How do you, like, what are some of the things that you do specifically at Acceleration Partners to, to filter for that or to, to put out there, like, these are the types of people that should apply and that would find a good fit? I know there's a lot of controversy around kind of this cultural fit thing, particularly around a lot of the DNI initiatives. Uh -huh. To me, this is like a vernacular thing. Like, I no company should be looking for carbon copies right. like of everyone. And, and I understand if that's like the fit, but I I believe, and as I think you do, in cultural fit. I think this is true with your spouse, with your community, with your company, which is like on these big principles. Like, we're pretty aligned. It doesn't mean we're the same. We have the same hobbies. We have the same way of thinking. But like you have like, as I, as I said, like if you start a church group on Sunday mornings, you don't want a rabid atheist in that group. That's not why you're there <laughs> to do that, like arguing with you about everything. Like there, there can be a group for that person. That's fine. But for that purpose, like that's not that's not the point of it. Right. And I think like if your company has some core things it believes in. Like it's not looking for a homogeneous group of people, but like you have to be aligned around those things. Um, and each company should really be different and it should be a different value proposition. Like we, we look, we're, we're a virtual company. We're, we're a marketing agency. We deal with really fast client services. Like that's not for everyone. Um, if you like consensus decision-making where you have a lot of time to do that, like we're not the right environment for you. Clients want, action they want fast. So we, we, we interview for cultural fit. And again, um, I've, yeah. I've used the word, even though I know it's a trigger point for some people, um, cultural alignment, I will say, not, not, not fit. And, and then aptitude to, to do the job. So the cultural part, we have a whole bank of behavioral based interview questions around our core values. 
and then examples of what a good answer sounds like or a bad answer. So I'll, I'll give you one. I always say, look, if people are interviewing and they do the research to find all these questions, and that's the kind of person we want to hire. <laughs> but Excel and improve is one of our core values. We are we 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 move quickly, voracious learners. Like we need people that are like that. So if I said Nathan, what's a what's a book you read or a course you've taken or something you've done to get better in the last couple of years, and you come up with crickets, like you're probably right. not. You can't come up with anything that you tried to do to get better in the last couple of years. Like probably not a not a great fit for our environment. Yeah, and I think in that. Um... I mean, you talk about culture fit, people say culture contribution, any of those things. It's important to talk about or or make it clear that we're talking about values. We're not talking about yes. um, like backgrounds, like let me go find someone who went to the same no. school that I did or anything like that. We're talking about someone who says like, is trying to achieve the same goals. Right. And you, you agree on the same, again, if, you, if, if, if you're a partner with someone and you don't have this share overlap the same values, there's no way that relationship will work out because it means when you get to the big things, you're, you're not, you're in discord uh, over those things. So, so again, our value of own it, um, there are just some people that, that it, again, they're, 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 I can see it early on. They're like, look, this thing got screwed up. Here's what I could have done better. Here's, I'm, I'm going to share the learnings with everyone. And then other people who want to duck and hide. And, and, and if, if you're at this company, and you're someone and who who doesn't have that mentality of just owning it, like it it it's really going to clash with the thing. But right, that is not a personality trait. It is not a it is not a it is not a gender. It is not a race. It is sort of a a, a belief set um, about the type of organization that you want to be in. Are there any things that that you're specifically looking to be challenged on or as you hire people, right? We talk about culture contribution yeah. um, in that side where maybe you're seeing things in the, in the values that aren't being represented as well as you'd like in the current team where you're actually seeking out people to, to um, either challenge the value, maybe not challenge the value, but challenge the team and the execution of the value. Uh, yeah. So, so right now we've been open with a company about this. We're super open about feedback. We have these discussions openly I think for some people that haven't been in an environment anymore, it's like a little getting used to. But yeah. so we have this value of excel and improve, which is like excellence is doing things really well, but you always have to be improving them. We, we've been over indexing on excellence and not improve. I think people have been a little too process oriented and they just not had, we're not taking the smart and the calculated risk. So we talked this through with the company and we're like, look, like, like making a mistake, not following a compliance process, making a mistake, forgetting to do it, like that's not good. Trying something new that doesn't work, but knowing that it wasn't going to put you out of business or whatever, like that, that is good. That's what we need. That's in a bit like failing to perform a compliance check is, is just a failure to follow a process. But we, we, we did have an open discussion that like, it feels like process is winning out over innovation and and we need to really get on the improvement side. And I think what you'll find is that what you're implicitly or explicitly rewarding as an organization is what's getting attention. And I think we were celebrating too minute too much the people that were doing things well and not the people that were taking smart risks. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm reading which I probably should have read a long time ago, but the the book Turn the Ship Around um and he's talking about, you know, so it's a, a submarine captain um who went through a lot of this and, and they had, you know, obviously every single process like down to, yeah. but it was all about not making mistakes. Like under no circumstances will you make a mistake. But on a nuclear sub that maybe is really important, right? <laughs> yeah. But he got yeah. into the point of like, they they got so focused on that, that they like kind of lost critical thinking Yeah, and, and that they weren't like the differentiation that you're trying to make of the type of mistake, right? Like messing up the nuclear reactor, that's a like the compliance. Level. Well, there's like commission, commission and omission. Like the, the, the whole VW diesel scandal happened because the CEO was so intolerant of mistakes when then they found out that the engine didn't deliver the, the promised emissions and EPG that he had promised for two years. They were like, we got to cover this up because <laughs> he's going to fire us all. And so they used all of their, you know, German engineering, like with, with Bangery to figure out how to cheat the whole system rather than solve the problem. Um, so it was a classic example. Yeah, you want, uh, uh, yeah, a, a mistake, like 
trying something new, understanding the consequence if it doesn't work. And, and, and that is not a mistake. That's a learning, right? right? If every night at 12 o'clock, you're supposed to check the boiler temperature and you fall asleep and forget it, like that's a mistake. Right. Like that's a mistake you need to fix. Yeah. Yeah. Are there, so as you adopt that, like, and you model that for the team, are there areas that you're pushing yourself or um, like challenging to make those kind of, of uh, like the healthy mistakes or take the risks that, you know, show the learning and growth? Yeah, I think it's less of, I think it's coaching it and modeling it. Mm -hmm. We've actually like, again, tried to coach our team. Like, here's how you can think about this. Here's how you should think about like, what's a mistake that you have the permission to make. One of the things that was really helpful we shared with the team was someone shared this picture of a boat. So with a water line and like, look, the below the water line stuff is going to sink the boat, right? We kind of really don't want to make those mistakes. <laughs> and in client services, I think it's hard because mistakes are publicly facing. So I think it's actually even harder to like put someone on their first call and have them say the wrong thing because then you got some real cleanup to do. But but to, to get leaders focused, like, look, the stuff that's above the water that's not going to stink the ship, like, let's make them, learn from them, not make them again. What we really need you to do is like the, watch the water line, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, last thing that I'm curious about is your shift going from here, right? You brought on a partner, uh, like investor partner yeah. in the business. It sounds like you're freeing up even more of your time to do content and and like be an individual creator in that way. Like, where do you go from here? What what are the next things that you're you're putting time into? Yeah, so you know, I have a a, a long time number two who's really assumed most of the operational control over the business the last couple of years. We've always operated that way. I actually think, uh, you know, that we operate on the traction kind of EOS model that like a, 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 a well-run, fast-growing business needs someone who, you know, comes up with 10 crazy ideas, needs, needs the visionary role, and it needs the integrator role, the person who keeps the train on the track, and then the person who figures out where, where they're going to go, lay new track. Um, and, and that's sort of always been our role. And as it gets bigger, you know, I realize like, look, what I don't want to do, my greatest value is not in managing people like I, i'm good at training teaching leading um that sort of stuff but i don't i don't want to be in checking calls all day and, and and sort of going through there are people that are much better at that than me and they actually they like that so i i think we we continue to sort of formalize that split where i i'm working on our uh like m a strategy right now and our new growth initiatives i'm continuing to do all of our leadership training our culture rolling out our new vision um, just being honest about what do I like to do? What do I have to do? And then what are the parts of the job that Matt's just better at, more qualified for? And, and then there's all this third lens that I think entrepreneurs screw up. And this is different in each part of the business. But what does the business need, right? What does it need at, from him and from me at $5 million or $10 million or $30 million? Because if I'm a $40 million business and I don't want to do any of the jobs that a CEO of a $40 million business needs to do, then I really shouldn't let my ego put me as the CEO, I should create the role that I actually am. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And you see people make the shift to, you know, chairman of the board or something else where they're still heavily involved or or and can still have a title or or whatever else, but they're actually optimizing for the business needs rather than their own ego. Yeah, the business needs and what they like to do, I think again, they're stepping their ego out of the way. Earlier stage, you see a lot of people who really started in sales and they're the CEO, but really they're the chief sales officer, mm -hmm. kind of wrapped in a CEO package. I, 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 I always felt strong. I didn't take the CEO title till we were like 200 people and uh, no, sorry, like 100 people in other countries. I, I just had GM mm -hmm. um, because I, 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 look, I think you can be a president. You see a lot of people of a $1 million business who are founder, CEO, and president. Like that is just a bad ego trip. But, but, but a president is sort of the person who runs everything. The, the CEO, the chief executive officer, that would imply that you have an executive team, right? right? So if you're the CEO of a business where you are the head of sales, the head of marketing, whatever, like, I don't, I mean, like you're the CEO of your own brain right. then, then at some point. So I, I, I just don't think that's the right title. I think the, the, you can be president, but I think a chief executive officer is actually has an executive team that they're leading and managing. That's just my my definition of it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, I'm excited to see you, the rest of the content that you continue to produce and and like what this next chapter looks like. Um, for everyone who wants to subscribe and follow along, where where should they go? Uh, yeah, uh, book, podcast, uh, newsletter sign up is all now at one place, robertglazer.com. Uh, 
I got maybe your advice. Other I got that all integrated over the last couple of years. So yep. it's uh, glazer.com. Nice. Sounds good. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Nathan.